Uh, hi everybody, my name is Rob Bennett and I work with the University of California Cooperative Extension System and tonight's workshop here in downtown San Francisco and the mission is called Improving Your Soil Quality for the Urban Food Grower and UC Cooperative Extension has uh, included catalysts, problem solvers, collaborators and educators and scientists uh, helping folks solve local problems and working with them to identify local problems around ag, natural resources, family and consumer and nutrition sciences for about a hundred plus years now. Um, we have a number of programs. The Master Gardener program, the 4-H program are the most famous, the most public. Um, livestock and natural resources management, water management, food systems, the area I work in, weed science, 4-H, uh, IPM are just among the few. We're part of the Division of Ag and Natural Resources that has uh, just recently added a sixth initiative. We historically had five initiatives, uh, endemic and invasive pests and diseases, healthy families and communities, water quality, quantity and security, and sustainable natural ecosystems and sustainable food systems. One of the things about our five strategic initiatives is that all of our efforts related to growing food and also forestry are all connected with all of those initiatives. And now that we've recently added energy and energy management and efficiency as a sixth umbrella strategic initiative in the Division of Ag and Natural Resources. That also connects very much in a number of ways with food and forestry. So a small world. So a hundred uh, hundred plus years in counting in California. It should be noted that in San Francisco there is no cooperative extension office. It is the only county in the state that does not have a cooperative extension office based at a county agency. Um, with that uh, soils have been forming for millions of years here on planet Earth. I want to also say that there are parts of this workshop that could be an entire semester or year-long course that I cover in a slide or two because it's about the main concepts that we're deriving from them. So keep that in mind as we develop this, this, uh, this effort. Um, so soils formed from millions of years of weatherization and glaciation over time um, that sort of eroding of rock combined with uh, natural plant parts that have biodegraded. Uh, much of North America was covered by glaciers in a number of phases uh, 14, and 10, 14 or so thousand years ago. Uh, not so much a huge portion of California was, only parts of the east and north. Um, but you can see on the, in the uh, diagram map on the left, the Central Valley. And also think of that as parallel to in parts of the Midwest. Uh, we call the Midwest a place that grows a lot of grains, something with, that starts with a B. Anybody know? The bread. The bread basket, right? Um, and part of the reason we call it that is because it's got a tremendously deep topsoil. But jumping back for a second around soil formation, the main concept here is that the parent material, the type of rock that the soil comes from, um, very much affects particle size and density. And there are three main types of ge geological formations, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. Um, sedimentary being tending to be at the bottom of oceans, rivers, and lakes. Um, metamorphic, did anybody see uh, Christopher Reeve in Superman when he, when he squeezes a piece of coal and, and what does it turn into? Anybody remember? Diamond. It turns into a diamond, right? Because he put a tremendous amount of Superman pressure on that, on that uh, piece of coal and it changed its physical structure. It metamorphized, so to speak. Um, and then igneous, which is primarily molten um, and or uh, cooled molten uh, rock formation. So again, um, soils form from igneous, uh, from various types of rock formations that affect particle size and that also affects pore size. Um, that ultimately will affect what's called aggregate stability. Can everybody say aggregate? Aggregate. aggregate. Um, so think of soils in terms of, in terms of horizontal layers. You've got your A horizon, also called your topsoil, usually in the first six to twelve inches, but it depends on which part of the world you're in. Um, you've got your subsoil layer, twelve to thirty-six inches, your parent material, and your bedrock. And this is a diagram very similar, showing that a little bit more visually. In an urban situation, in most cases, historically, um, especially in the last 50 to 100 years or so, um, a lot of the time that topsoil level has been 
excavated, right? It's been often removed in preparation of a, of a site to then have a residence or a commercial business on it or something to that effect, right? Um, so this is your goal, okay? A dark, rich, crumbly soil that holds together well when it's dry, holds together well also when it's wet and also has a high water holding and nutrient holding capacity. What are the, oops, I wasn't supposed to let you see that. What are the four things plants need, guys? Real basic, think basically. Oxygen. Uh, don't say where the oxygen is yet, that's usually the last, go ahead. Four things plants need. Water. Water. Nutrients. What about? Sunlight. Sunlight, right? And then you said oxygen. What part of the plant is the oxygen important around besides the part above the soil? I gave a little hint. The roots. The roots, exactly, right? So everybody take a deep breath. Okay. Right? Remember, plants photosynthesize and they respire, right? Um, so respiring being the opposite of photosynthesis. Um, and that is very, very important towards their met metabolic process, their, their plant health, so to speak, right? So um, when we're talking about nutrients, right, we were talking about nutrients generally coming from the soil for most plants on the planet. Um, and we also think of them in terms of macronutrients and micronutrients. What do you think that means in terms of how much plants need those particular nutrients? Macro's a little, macro's a lot. Exactly. So um, the macronutrients, there are six of them, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and then calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And then the micronutrients are uh, usually used or needed by plants in lesser amounts uh, and lesser frequency as a generalization. So they, they are things like iron and boron and manganese. And can everybody say molybdenum? Molybdenum. So molybdenum is one of those nutrients that you will almost never in your whole life hear that, that a soil has a deficiency of because it's got, it's very small in concentration but it's well distributed for much of the parts of the planet that are somewhat fertile other than deserts. So the soil matrix, right? What are soils made up of, right? Um, about half of soils are air and water. Again, everybody take a deep breath. Okay. Think of those pore spaces, the concept of porosity, right? And then mineral particles. Now that little pizza slice there at the bottom, that's organic matter. Everybody go, um, one more time, um, okay. So that is very, very important in terms of helping soils to hold water and hold nutrients. Is organic matter the stuff they talk about in the National Organic Program? Is it, um, is organic the certified California organic farming organization, right? Or everybody repeat after me, because organic is a term that's sometimes used in the marketing world a lot lately, right? And most of the time, people, when they're talking about organic farming or gardening, they're talking about um, growing food with, with minimal to no use of pesticides or synthetic fertilizers, right? But when we're talking about organic, we're talking about the following. Please repeat after me. Organic matter is? Organic matter is? Everything that is or was once alive. Everything that is or was once alive. So you and I, we're organic, right? If we don't get treated with formaldehyde or some kind of chemical when we get put in the ground or, or depending on you know, what our end point is, right? We're probably gonna wind up being worm food, most of, most of us, except maybe our bones, okay? Um, so soil is a matrix of minerals, organic matter, air, water, and living organisms. And this is a different kind of image um, evidencing that, right? You see the, the mineral particles, a little bit of clay, the water, and then the air and then colonies of microbacteria. And soils are very, very complex. There is an interplay between the minerals and the living parts. The other thing about soils is that they're broken up into sizes, right? Um, in really proportions of particle size. For the purpose of this workshop, I want you to leave the big gravel piece to the left out of the picture in your mind for a second, for a little bit, okay? Um, so soils are made up of proportions of sand, silt, and clay. 
Um, and the thing about soils is a good healthy soil that holds water and nutrients well um, has a good physical structure to it and physical structures of soil is the baseline most important thing you can have. If you don't have a good physical structure, everything else you have to work on even harder, right? Um, anybody here ever gone to the beach and dug a hole in the sand? And then run to the water and put some water into the, into the hole? Does it stay there or does it sink? It sinks. It sinks. Does it, if you run back to get some water and come back, is the water still there or has it already infiltrated completely? Gone. Pretty much gone, right? Um, so the thing about that is there's a lot of pore space in that sand, right? Um, and because sands have a larger particle size, that allows for a lot of pore space. And then when you inundate that with water, the water fills up those pore spaces as well. The next smallest um, particle size is silt. And the third being um, clay. So before we continue, we're going to just leave that up there for a minute. We're going to do a little hands-on activity. Come on, get up. Come on over. Check this out. Okay. So, in thinking about the physical indicators of soil quality, there's some basic physical tests one can do um, in, at, in your yard or farm space, garden space, whichever it may be, or in, even in a park, potentially, if you're part of a community garden in a park, right? Um, the first one is called the color test, right? So what part of our, our senses do we use for the color test? Eyes. Our eyes, right? So just looking, without even touching any of the soil at the moment, right, what do you notice of the differences of those, four, those soils in those four trays over there? Variations in color. Variations in color, very good. So as a generalization, one can say that the darker the soil, generally the more organic matter it has, and generally the more nutrient rich it has, and as a result holds more water and more nutrients. Uh, over time. Um, so we're going to think about this in terms of how well the soil holds together. That The first test was the color test, really basic, right? The next one, everybody see my water bottle, right? Um, who wants to get a little bit soiled? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> he, you're right, you're right. he gets soiled regularly, huh? it sounds like. Any volunteers? See, okay, he said. Okay, all right. So why don't you come around to here so we can be seen through the, by the camera, right? And you're going to take a nice big handful of this and you're going to hold it over the tray. And I need a second person maybe on this side. Okay. okay. Um, I want you to take one of those. And again, nice big handful, reach in. Okay, first squeeze it and then try to flatten your hand slowly. Okay. How well does it begin to take a little bit of your palm's shape when it's dry? This one a little bit, right? Okay. Not so much, right? You're pretty, pretty dry. So I'm going to wet you down. And th these two tests are called the ball test and the ribbon test. What do you think we're trying to form? A ball and a ribbon. A ball and a ribbon. Rocket scientists. You guys are brilliant, all right? So first, squeeze it, try, squeeze it nice and tight. Try to see how well uh, it forms the shape of your palm. Okay, you got the beginnings of it. You're getting a little better. Are you noticing that one of them is taking up the water more? Yeah, the one with more organic matter. Right, that one's taking up, that's right, that one's taking up more of the uh, water more and faster. This one's kind of taking a while to get you to where you want to be. You can also take more. You okay? <laughs> okay. So now you're going to keep squeezing. Try to form a ball like roughly a little smaller than a golf ball if you can. Okay. You might need some more agua. Yeah. Looks like she's pretty good. There you go. Look at that thing. 
<laughs> All right. So you were able to form a ball, right? Um, so how well soil holds together, it's called its ability to aggregate. Everybody say aggregate. aggregate. And then also that is partially a function of how much either clay or humus, which is a type of organic matter it has. Oh, you got a ball too. Okay, nice. Now what we're going to do is unfortunately we're going to break up the, these particular uh, soils in our hands um, and you're going to try to do what's called a ribbon test. And the idea here is you're going to kind of, it's actually very therapeutic. Okay, you can, you're going to slowly rub your thumb over the soil a little bit at a time and try to get it to form what's called a ribbon. Um, and that would just hang over your fist. If we were in the Midwest, in the breadbasket area, right, and we were to dig into some of the deeper parts of that soil where that soil is easily three, five, six, eight feet deep, right, you would potentially be able to form a ribbon that would hang off of your fist but, hang, but stay on uh, your fist without falling off completely over time. Okay, so just keep kind of rubbing and you're going to rub it over that, that point in the middle of your finger so it begins to hang a little bit. All right, you're starting to get it. How are you doing? Not so good. Not so good, not as much, right? So, um, this one actually has a decent amount of clay of the three. Remember I was mentioning that its ability to hold together was partly the, the proportion of clay also. Um, you're also getting it nice and flat and it's really absorbed lots of the water. That one, it's got, you just, it. it's got a lot of rocks in it, but also you're just having a tough time not able to form a full ribbon, right? Um, so again, if you were able to form a ribbon, it shows it would hold well together. You're getting the beginnings of it. Um, you not as much. Um, and it, uh, that's a basic, we're going to see visuals of the, of the ribbons on the, on the images on the screen shortly, uh, but those are basic uh, tests you can do with your soil at home or at the farm, depending on your situation. So for those who have gotten soiled, you can put your soils back and I'm going to give you a, a, some paper towel so you can clean up. And then I need, I need two other volunteers and maybe somebody with a watch would be lovely if that's possible. You got a watch? Okay. So make sure it's nice and cl closed. Okay. All right. Close it tight, don't open it. All right, and then you're gonna start shaking. <laughs> don't worry, we have a sink in the back for after. Um, okay, so this is called the soil sedimentation test, right? And it'll give us a sense of the proportion of, what are the three particle sizes again? Clay. Clay. Sand. Silt. Silt and sand, right? And which one was the biggest one? Sand. Sand, right? So of the three of them, which do you think will fall out first? Sand. 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 Very good. Good instincts, right? They're the biggest particle size. It makes sense they would fall out first, right? So this is called the soil sedimentation test. I want you, you do, while you're shaking, use your imagination for a second. You're in the middle of a river in a canoe. The river has flooded, right? It goes over the banks, right? The water goes over the banks and eventually it subsides back, right? What does it drop off in, on the bank? Drops silt and nutrients, right? Same basic concept in the soil sedimentation test. Now, I have to admit some guilt on something, right? I bought these bottles at a 99 cent store at 10.30 at night before a workshop on a Saturday like three years ago. They should be quart size bottles. They're not. They're slightly smaller than quart size. I think they're half quart or whatever it is. They're not quart size, okay? Uh, or one of that one might be. But anyways, point being, make sure you do this with a quart size bottle uh, exercise and also if you buy the bottles, you'll never, you're not as likely to use them for anything else in the rest of its future history. So plan on it being their future use. Okay, put the bottles down and we're going to let them sit. We're going to follow the rules of threes for um, in the following way. 30 seconds, 3 minutes, and 30 minutes. So in 30 seconds, what did you say would likely fall out first? Sand. Sand. In 3 minutes, what do you think might fall out first next? Silt. 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 And then in 30 minutes, you all are going to remind me to look at the jars again. Okay? 
Everybody good with that? Yep. Um, so normally you would have uh, shaken for about a minute or two. It doesn't have to matter. The timing stuff comes afterwards. So before we sit down to keep going, right, let's take a look and see if we've got our first layer at least. Okay. Some of them are easy to see through than others. Yeah, you definitely got on that one. You starting to see it? Somewhat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. A little bit. All right, all right, all right. So we're going to have to remember to look at these at the end of the workshop again, okay? All right. Um, okay, let's, let's grab a squat again. We're going to keep going. And then when we take a break, you can wash up. Is that all right? Okay, okay, cool. All right. Okay, so basic concept here. Soil porosity, everybody say porosity. Porosity. Okay. Porosity is the percentage of a soil that is poor space or air or water. The average soil has a porosity of about 50%, okay, give or take. Sands have larger pores but less total pore space than clays. And that's your main concept for that. Ignore bulk density for now. Same concept, visual images, right? It's about how well air and water move through our soils. Without air and water around the roots to be able to have the plants grow, bountiful blossoms and nutritious harvests, right? Then we don't get healthy plants. The other thing about this whole scenario is it's very much about learning about your plants, right? Putting the right plant in the right place. Cuídese, Antonio. Um, if you put a rose in the shade, it's very likely to get sick, right? Roses need full sun. Many plants, especially vegetables, and tend to need full sun. Full sun is six to eight hours a day. You should also do research on its cultural care. So what kind of soil pH it needs, what kind of drainage it needs, um, airflow, uh, what its times of fruiting and flowering are. Things to think about, right? Here, again, the more uh, air and water that, it, that can flow through without being in overabundance, the better. The thing about plant growth and plant health is it's about balance, right? Everything in, in overabundance can be tricky, right? Um, but keeping plants healthy over time will be about having a good soil structure. So again, main concept. In soils with a good structure, the pore space that occurs between what are called peds, peds are the tiny little clumps of soil, right, um, is relatively large and allows water and air movement. Well-developed structure is very important in general, but especially in high clay soils, right? Uh, and clay soils with a pore structure restrict water and air movement. Have any of you ever gone hiking in the mountains or on the side of the road and there's um, soil you step in and it's been raining and you leave a big footprint and then you come back a couple of days later and it stopped raining and it's warmed up and that footprint is hard as a rock, right? That soil probably had a decent amount of clay in it, okay? And it's, it's a matter of balance. Too much clay restricts air and water flow. Too much sand, you have tons of drainage and tons of uh, airflow in there, but you'll have a difficulty holding water, right? So having a balance of good proportions of sand, silt, and clay is key to the picture. So we did the color test. We did the texture by feel test, which was the ribbon and the ball test, right? Actually, we did the, the, the texture by field just holding the soil first, and then we did the ribbon and the ball test. And we also did the soil sedimentation test to get a sense of percentage of sand, silt, and clay. So these are the ribbons I was talking about. Uh, soil texture is the single most important physical property of the soil. It'll help uh, as an indicator for understanding water flow potential and water holding capacity, fertility potential, right? The ability for the soil to hold nutrients and suitability for urban uses like bearing capacity, like if you're gonna build a building, right? Because um, soil has many utilities, not just plant growth, right? And so this one on the lower right, this image on the lower right is the kind of ribbon you might get 
get in the Central Valley of California, or you might get in um, the Midwest in the breadbasket where there was a tremendous amount of sediment deposited over millions of years and there's a very deep topsoil, topsoil layer. Um, so we did the, the soil suspension and sedimentation test and the instructions were among those you picked up. But the idea behind it, right, is you then take a ruler, okay, and again, the, the data sheets and instructions are over there. Um, you would actually measure the height of your layers over the total height of all of the layers. What does that sound like in math? Percentages, well, percentages would be if you multiplied it by a, a hundred. What is it before it's a percentage? What's that? A ratio. A ratio, or it starts with an F? Fraction. Fraction, very good. Got one more. Thanks. Um, so if you were to turn into that, the front page is the instructions of the soil sedimentation test. Turn to the back of the front page and you have a data sheet. Voila, right? Okay, and the idea is you take your own soils, you put them in a quart-sized bottle, you do what we did, we, sh you know, two or three handfuls, big handfuls of soil, you add the rest with water to the collar, you shake for a minute or two, right? You let it settle, in 30 seconds you'll get sand, in 30 minutes or so you'll get a silt layer, you can see a silt layer right here, right? And then in about 30 minutes you'll get clay. You also have space on that on those sheets to actually plug in your measurement numbers, right? So you can do your own fraction, you can multiply that per, by 100 and you get a percentage. The idea being you with that percentage you can take your percentage of sand, let's assume it was 20%, right? Um, and your percentage of silt Let's say it was 30% and you follow the grid lines, right? And then let's say the remainder was 50%. So you have a high clay soil, okay? All right. This is how you do your most basic level of nomenclature for soil. It gets more complicated after this because the soil scientists start to give them fancy names that sound kind of quirky, right? But at this level you at the very least can get a sense of the water holding and nutrient holding capacity in terms of its physical structure, the percentage of sand, silt, and clay as a relative proportion to each other uh, will give you the soil texture classification. So it might be a sandy loam, might be a silty clay loam, or a sandy clay, all depends on your proportion, right? And that will very much tell you how well you can grow plants in a variety of ways in your soil. So again, the physical indicators of soil quality. The chemical indicators of soil quality are sometimes things that we hear a lot on the, um, on the commercials on the TV or sometimes we, if we've studied biology in high school or college we may have heard of them. Um, the first being the pH test, right? So um, I was referring to the deodorant commercials in the 80s when they used to talk about them being pH balanced, right? Um, and then electroconductivity test for soluble salts, usually in a unit of parts per million. And then something called cation exchange capacity. So. The first chemical indicator of soil quality is soil pH. Um, soil pH is measured on a simple scale from 0 to 14. Sometimes folks call it 1 to 14, it's actually 0 to 14. Um, the reality is I call it a simple scale because the pH scale is a negative logarithm, right? So each value in between the 9 and 10 is actually a, a, a proportion of 10. Um, so let's say you've got a, a soil pH of 6.5 to a 6.6 .6 difference between two spots, right? In the, the world of pH, because it's a negative logarithm, even though it looks like a very small difference, it's actually a fairly large difference because we've taken, we've created a scale to keep things simple as humans, right? Um, anybody here ever known somebody, uh, I, oftentimes they tend to be from the south, part of the United States, who talk about sweet soils or sour soils? Anybody ever heard that? No? Okay. They're of course literally referring to sometimes folks used to eat soil, but they're talking about a soil that has a higher pH being sweet, right? And a soil with a lower pH being sour. Um, anybody here like to eat blueberries? 
Right? I like to eat blueberries sometimes with my breakfast in the morning. Um, blueberries like a slightly acidic soil, so a 5.5 or so they tend to like, right? Um, as a generalization, most plants very much prefer a soil between, with a pH between a 6 and a 7. Okay, um, 7 being the official neutral, but uh, the range of 6 to 7 being more the optimal over time. And the reason for that uh, is because once you get to the outer parts of the pH scale, right, you start to get to the extremes of what pH could be. Um, and if you've got something like you know, a 10 or 11 or higher, or a 3 or 4 or lower on the pH scale, something's wrong. Okay, either you've got some major contaminants in the soil or you've done the test wrong or something, something is really off, okay, because that's a very bad indicator. So what are some common foods that you think of or common supermarket items that you might think of that are more acidic? What? Lemon. Lemon, so any citrus, right? What else? I'll, t I'll give you a hint. They just started a tax on it in some parts of the Bay Area. Soda. Soda, right, very good. How about um, something that's more alkaline? It's part of the human physiological process. I'll give you an example. Mother's milk. milk. There you go. Okay. How about another another uh, reference? Think of the supermarket. What do you go buy that has spinach? Baking soda, right, Arm & Hammer, right? Um, so the reason the pH scale and pH as a chemical indicator of soil quality is so important is if you look at the macronutrients, right, the nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, the calcium, magnesium, uh, and sulfur as the macronutrients, and then the main micronutrients, iron, manganese, boron, um, copper, and zinc, and everybody say molybdenum? All right, our best absorbed, notice that these bars are the thickest, oops, camera, all right, are the thickest between the six and the seven. The majority of the bars are the most thick between the six and the seven, okay? That means between the six and the seven, that's where most plants can uptake the most amount of nutrients through soil water solutions. Okay, um, when we talk about fertilizers, when you go to buy a fertilizer at a store, often they'll give you three numbers. Anybody know what those three numbers are? Okay. NPK, and what's NPK? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. You gotta talk louder, there's a camera. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Excellent, very good. Are they telling you the whole story? No, they're not, right? Um, so that's the key thing in this particular situation, right? It's about really reading the labels, making sure you're getting the whole story. NPK are not the only macronutrients plants need. Oftentimes you'll see a little line of a certain proportion of trace minerals, meaning the micronutrients as well. Um, these are import important for plant health. Um, another chemical indicator of soil quality, oh, and also in terms of the pH meters, right, there are lots of different types of pH meters. Which do you think is more precise? Analog. Yeah. The digital is more precise, right. However, if you are not growing food for sale, Right? And you're only doing some basic, you know, maybe a backyard garden kind of situation. Which do you think is cheaper? Probably this one, right? So things to think about. Um, they'll both give you results pretty quickly, but if you're going to do this professionally or you're going to be doing a lot, it's actually worth it to buy the, the, the higher end one um, over time. Uh, also, sometimes this company, the Rappi Test, uh, will give you just the straight pH meter, or sometimes you can get at the very least NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But it's still not the whole story, right? Um, a reagent test, different kind of way to do soil pH, right? A little more complicated, a little bit more expensive. You have to still match up colors just like this one, right? Slightly more precise. Things to think about in terms of cost, right? Um, in, the second indicator of soil quality is electroconductivity. What does that sound like? Electroconductivity. <laughs> 
Exactly. So you put some soil in a soil water solution, you've added some water, right? And you're running a current through it and you get a number. That number will give you, um, will, that number the unit will be in parts per million and the measures of soluble salts. Usually soluble salts is something you measure when you've been applying fertilizers and you're concerned about um, there being an over fertilization. You're getting nitrogen tie up, right? Um, usually there's too much nitrogen. The other way this can sometimes happen is when you have water in, uh, water soluble fertilizers. What's the famous one Scott's put out? Miracle, Miracle Grow. Anybody here grow, you grow their plants with Miracle Grow? Okay. You guys are interesting group. Uh, most of the time I get somebody with houseplants at home who've been using miracle Grow for years, right? And sometimes if you've done that, you'll find a little crust that forms on the top of the pot, right? And that's water-soluble fertilizer, right? So you've been watering after you've applied fertilizer or depending on how you apply it, sometimes there are hoses where you can like put it in the, in the little cup thing on the hose and you can apply it that way, right? Um, but a lot of the time, water soluble fertilizers, you wind up washing a lot of those nutrients away, right? So everybody take out a dollar and give me your money. I'm the fertilizer company. I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Things to think about, right? Slow release or water insoluble fertilizer may be a better way to go to get fertilizer around your plant's roots in a little bit more of a slower, sustained way over time. Not saying one can endorse one company over, over another. It all depends on what your needs are. If, you're, if you feel like your plants need just a quick shot of nutrients, water-soluble fertilizer might be just fine. Things to think about, right? Um, about compost tea? Compost tea is another one. Now, there's a lot of... Um, Scientifically, there are still some, some scientists who don't believe in compost tea as a practical application. There's some issues in the scientific world around compost in general. A lot of it has been around the fact that any one pile of compost compared to the next pile usually has a lot of differences, right? So compost very much varies in terms of quality based on the feedstock in which that was used to create it, right? What, what proportions of what did you add in to the pile to get that quality, right? In terms of uh, water holding and nutrient holding capacity, much like as if you were talking about a soil, right? Um, there are a decent amount of folks in the organic uh, agriculture world that do believe compost tea is a, is a good thing. The science of it is still being worked on to a degree. Um, so it all depends on who you ask. But it can be a, a good way to introduce good nutrients to your plants um, and or, or potentially good microorganisms to your plants as well. Go ahead. What about permaculture juice? Yeah, you, you reminded me something I forgot. So take some of this, take, you can touch it if you want to, you don't have to, you can open it, you can see it, smell it. Uh huh. Go ahead, take the bag, come on. <laughs> All right. So that is worm compost, right? Or basically mostly worm castings. And something interesting about my bags of soil here, the only time, some of these are slightly busted, the only times I've, I ever use these soils is when I'm teaching this workshop ever, period. For four plus years now, I've been teaching this workshop here in California. And about three and a half years ago, I got that bag of worm compost. Some of these are busted and so they dried out because of the holes in the bags. Most of them are in good shape. That one is in good shape. You know, that's very wet still, right? It's been three years. I've never ever added water to that, okay? These are all dry as a T-bone, okay? Except for the water that we sprayed on your hand and then you got a little bit of it back onto the tray. I never added anything to the worm bin, uh, to the worm compost at all. Yeah, it's, it's completely, it's completely uh, wet, you know, okay? And it doesn't smell either, three, four years later, right? 
So basically, worm compost is worm doo-doo, right? It's castings of worms that ate through fruit scraps or veggie scraps, right? Um, and they, they uh, excrete it out and add it to, if you add this stuff to the soil, um, it actually uh, does some really great things to improve your soil quality over time as well. Right? So, um, I flew through the second chemical indicator of soil quality, right? Uh, electro, conductivity. electroconductivity, right? Um, again, basically measured in, un in parts per million um, and usually a measure of soluble sur salts or fertilizer or if you're over fertilizing. Most folks would wind up buying this and the, the higher tech ones of these also have an, LA, an EC meter on them as well, okay? Um, there aren't really simple field-based electroconductivity tests necessarily. Go ahead. Hay que leer las instrucciones para que no se electrifica. Sí, no lo, no lo he visto. Hay que tener cuidado con la electricidad siempre. <laughs> He's talking about running a current through the soil. Don't you have to worry about yourself getting electrocuted? Well, that's why you follow the instructions, was my response, right? Um, so the third uh, chemical indicator of soil quality is something called cation exchange capacity, right? We, we mentioned that um, a soil with a higher proportion of organic matter, such as humus, uh, not hummus that we eat, right, but humus, um, or some proportion of clay will tend to have a higher cation exchange capacity because it has these negative charges, okay, on the surface. And it's hard to imagine this, right? You have to use your imagination a little bit. But the idea here is that most of the macronutrients and, and many of the micronutrients are positively charged, right? And if the soil particle has a negative charge or that aggregate, that ped or clump, has a negative charge, right? The ability for that interchange between the nutrients so the plant can uptake nutrients and it can't happen without water um, becomes possible, right? Um, so a similar image, same kind of basic idea, right? There's an exchange between uh, water or I should say through water of nutrients between the roots and um, the soil particles. So here's how it happens, right? Let's say you have a soil that's got some organic matter or humus in it or a platy clay soil, right? Here's your plant root, right? Um, there's a negative charge on the outer perimeter of the platy clay soil or the humus, right? And the plant root is releasing the protons in order to be able to take in uh, the cations. Okay, um, so over time, if you improve your soil with a lot of organic matter, it'll increase the cation exchange capacity and thus the, the nutrient and water holding capacity of the soil. So main idea, organic matter and clay has a large surface area. Incorporating organic matter enhances nutrient exchange in the root zone and increases the percentage of organic matter and cation exchange capacity, all right? What is organic matter again? Anything that, anything that was alive that is alive. Is or was once alive, exactly, right? Um, so it's not that marketing term, right? But when we're talking about organic matter in organic chemistry, we're often um, talking about it in terms of, in many ways like the human skeleton, right? The carbon is kind of our vertebra, right? It holds everything together. All of the other nutrients that connect up to it are what then makes plant growth possible, right? Um, so I use this acronym to, to remember this concept around organic matter called honk your horn, right? It's very easy, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. Again, this is your goal, but this is a microscopic blow up, right? So a soil with a lot of um, organic matter will tend to also have lots of soil life in it. Lots of fungal, healthy fungal threads um, and good soil bacteria as well, okay? Um, but 
oftentimes it takes some work to get there, right? Soil building is one of those things, you know, we like to think as humans we can do overnight, but to do it really well over time, it takes millions of years or at least a good portion of our lifetime, right? Um, but this is kind of your goal, um, to have all of these processes of soil development occurring all at the same time. So here you've got living organisms like worms and bugs. You've got stabilized organic matter, also called SOM, right? Uh, sometimes referred to as humus. The idea behind humus is that humus is organic matter that has decomposed. It's gotten to a point where it's still decomposing, but that rate of decomposition has massively decreased, right? It's no longer uh, releasing uh, gases, right? It's no longer hot as a pile. Um, it's kind of stabilized, right? And then you have like decomposing organic matter, um, which might be plant parts in the soil as well, okay? Um, and then fresh residue. What is it a uh, practice that a lot of farmers and gardeners do in their, in their uh, crop beds in the fall? Manure. Manure or? Starts with a C. Cover cropping, cover. cover cropping, right? We use cover crops to protect our soil beds from the winter rains or snow, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, and you can incorporate them into your soil in the early spring as well and get some fresh residue of plant parts into the soil. Oftentimes, cover crops are either some kind of uh, grassy uh, grain like an oat or a rye um, or a legume. What do legumes do? They fix nitrogen. They fix nitrogen, exactly, from the atmosphere into the soil for plants use, right? Um, but the goal is to have all of these processes occurring in your soil all at the same time. Um, I teach a three-part, uh, three-workshop series and, and a lot of the focus of the third workshop is this, um, once we get to it. So chemical indicators of soil quality, main concept, again, cation exchange capacity very much affects soil fertility by affecting water and nutrient holding capacity. Pretty basic, right? This is your main goal, again, a dark, rich, crumbly soil that will hold together when, when dry, but also hold together when it's wet. And then the biological indicators of soil quality are kind of pretty basic at the macro level, right? The, noting what kind of bugs and critters might be in your soil. Starts with a W. Worms. Worms, right? Worms and then some level of, of insect life is usually good to see in the soil, right? Um, and then you'll know if something's wrong with the soil because it'll start to smell bad. Um, it'll have less uh, air in it. Uh, so it could potentially go anaerobic for some reason or another. Um, then there are also biological tests you can do for your bacteria as well. Um, there's some great companies out there. A good healthy soil uh, will encourage the soil life such that those organisms that would attack the roots of your plants like nematodes which are microscopic worms can also be eaten by some of the beneficial nematodes as well and still survive and flourish over time. So this is a microscopic blow up of one of the nematodes getting eaten by the other. And then think in terms of um, plant growth factors, right? What, what do plants need to be healthy and survive? One of the key limiting factors for plant growth on the planet is nitrogen, but in terms of plant health and meta metabolic processes, uh, one of the limiting factors for plant nitrogen availability in soils is carbon. Right? So just like with a compost pile, there's a balance between carbon and nitrogen. Um, anybody here ever used wood chips for pathways in like a school garden or community garden kind of situation? What are you adding to the, to the pathways? Carbon, right? Basically wood is for the most part carbon, right? Um, and what does that do to the weeds in the pathways? Smothers them. Smothers them, right? So um, it keeps the weeds from germinating, right? Keeps the weeds down, doesn't let the sunlight 
touch the soil, right? We know there's a seed bank of weeds in the soil to begin with. Um, and part of what it does is it also, besides just smothering them and keeping the sun from getting there, it also prevents uh, nitrogen uh, use by those, those uh, weed seeds that are trying to germinate as well, okay? Um, and when you start to talk about soils over time, you're just like with a compost pile, you're talking about carbon-nitrogen ratios of two or three to one. Um, and so think of compost piles when you're, when you're working with soils as well. Uh, many of those same processes occur in the soil itself. Manures, other soil amendments to improve fertility. Um, Someone mentioned manures earlier. What kind of manures are we talking about? Horse and cow. Horse and cow, right? So in an urban setting like San Francisco where we have a lot of cats and dogs running through our open spaces, how's that for our garden beds? No? Why? Because uh, what they eat is can have deposit um, different Poisons, basically. Right. So, what kind of organisms? Uh, what are they? What are they called? Ruminants, Ruminants right? Or herbivores, right? Uh, versus carnivores like dogs and cats, mountain lions, right? Um, raccoons might eat just about anything, depending on where you are, right? But um, so, in in talking about ruminants, right? Uh, those are organisms that on, only eat plants, and the meat eaters, the carnivores if you use that manure in your soil, will often, that manure will often be carrying pathogens in them. Um, there is E. coli in just about all manures on Earth, uh, but some of the worst pathog pathogens come from the, the, herb, the uh, carnivore manures in particular, right? Um, and do you want to use wet herbivore manure or dry herbivore manure? Dry. Dry, okay, why? because it's gone through uh, a process of composting where it is no longer going to be toxic to the soil. Right. The it's high concentration of Right. So of nitrogen or something. Exactly. So it's generally high in nitrogen to begin with, but it has gassed off some of that when it's wet to become dry, right? Um, that's part of it. But also, if you're amending with wet, uh, met wet manure and then you plant immediately after that, what can happen to your plant's roots? High in nitrogen. Think of a, uh, something called ammonia. Yeah, you can burn up your plant's roots, literally, uh, because it's so concentrated with nitrogen, right, um, when it's wet. Um, so in the organic programs, like the National Organic Program, I think they say something like 100 or 120 days you're supposed to amend your soil uh, with manure uh, before planting. Um, Leave, leave a period of about 100 to 120 days. That's a long period of time. That's no joke if you're a farmer trying to make money and uh, sell crops so you can pay your lease or pay your rent, right? Um, so it's about crop scheduling a lot of the time. Um, we already talked about nitrogens and uh, greens and browns and, and uh, nitrogen tie up a little bit. Um, but there are other organic amendments like blood meal and bone meal. They're generally very high sources in phosphorus and some nitrogen. The thing about uh, organic amendments like blood meal and bone meal is it's very important that you read the package, right? Just find out where the process occurred, how long they took, um, was there any kind of a pasteurization process, did they kill off any of the bad organisms in there, right? Um, things to think about. And then we talked a little bit about um, miracle Grow in particular, but miracle Grow is just one example of, of water-soluble fertilizers, right? The other thing I want you to think about in terms of fertilizers, and again, it's, this is a judgment call that you make yourself. This is not my um, endorsing any one brand or not, but the thing about um, synthetic fertilizers is they've often gone through a process where there's a lot of energy used to create 
synthetic fertilizers, right? So think of that, those carbon reactions going on in order to create large amounts of fertilizers. Uh, my ex-wife and I used to live in the South Bronx and in Hunts Point there was a fertilizer plant. And when you couple that with a, a very high traffic terminal market of 10 to 20,000 uh, people coming in to work at night and then five or 10,000 trucks coming through a neighborhood, you start to get a lot of particulate in the air and she happened to have asthma. Think about the relationships in your ambient environment, right? Um, soil compaction, okay? Uh, why is soil compaction a problem? Why can it be bad for plant health? Go ahead. Because it takes away the aeration uh, the space between the uh, ground. Yeah, so. yeah, so the porosity, right? Everybody take a deep breath. Right? That air around the plant's roots is really, really key, right? Um, it, soil compaction or stepping in the area of the soil around the plant's roots can actually reduce water infiltration and air infiltration and permeability. It also has a particular effect in the time when the, the summer crops are getting, starting to get, get thought about being planted, right? Um, so think about late spring, early summer. The ambient temperature is now 70, 75 degrees, right? You've got a compacted soil over here and a nice loose fluffy soil over there. You want to plant your tomatoes and your corn and some of your squashes that like warm feet, right? Um, for the summer planting season. Um, which do you think is going to warm up faster, the compacted soil or the loose and fluffy soil? Loose the loose and fluffy soil. Very good. And then think in terms of raised beds, right? So the thing about raised beds is it's, it's, it's about balance like everything else in the growing crops process, right? By, by raising up beds or creating furrows, right, you're increasing what that can go into the soil? Air, Air right? Because you're increasing the surface to volume ratio overall, okay? You've got more surfaces ar around the soil for the air to get in. That's good overall in terms of plant health and keeping the plant's roots happy with plant, uh, plant root oxygen availability, but also what's that effect, how does that affect your water needs? Increase. Yeah, generally you might have to increase your watering a little bit in the beginning. Now, over years, if you develop your soil over time, you're continually improving your soil quality. You're, every time you're harvesting or planting, you're amending with some compost. Maybe you're cover cropping in the fall. Maybe you're adding a little manure or some every other year in the spring. All depends, right? People get their practices and they kind of get in, in sync and they sometimes they stick to those practices over time. But if you've improved your soil quality over years and you've, you're also doing raised beds, over time you'll find that you can water less frequently but deeper and less often, right? So your soil has improved up to a point where it's more like that worm compost or I tricked you, I actually used, this one wasn't soil at all, this was waste management compost, okay? Like the company, waste management. Right? So it was landscape waste compost. Right? Um, this one, these two were actually soils from eastern Contra Costa County. This one very, very high in, in um, clay, but notice when it's dry, it's like a rock. Right? And this one much more sandy, both not too far from each other in eastern Contra Costa County, but good examples. And that's pretty much it on mulches and amendments, cover cropping. One can do whole workshops on interplanting, companion planting. This is usually where I take a short break before we wrap up on the second part. I know we're running late. You guys want to just get up and stretch and wash hands? Yeah, come on, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So you're going to divide up into Let's see here. Oh yeah, cool, I have four examples. Husband has to separate. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, all right, so take a look at these scenarios. These are all, you all have the same one, okay? And you, the idea here is you identify potential sources of contaminants. 
Okay, and since we don't have such a large group, why don't we just go ahead and spit it out? So don't be bashful, speak. What's that? Lead paint? Yeah. Yep. What's the question? So what, what, what are our sources of contaminants on this site? Why is our old oil ponds? So some hydrocarbons maybe wouldn't force stain, maybe some solvents. Solvents, right? Pesticides in the orchard, as right. you stated, residual pesticides, and also uh, potentially leaky, stored pesticides in the barn. Right. We don't know what's in those oil drums, right? Exactly. What else? What's a little bit more hidden that hasn't really been talked about too much? Uh, is there a septic tank or has there been an old uh, outhouse on credit? Right, you don't know. And even um, pesticides for the grounds, right, beyond the orchard history, right? Just basic, like maybe Roundup spraying for a little bit of weed growth here and there, right? Right, so that's one. And the idea is to keen you up on being aware of um, what other sources of contaminants are. Okay, bring those back. And you two are, are going to have to share this one because I only have two copies of that one. Okay. So now you're in a slightly more urbanized situation. Thanks. Okay. And take a look and think about potential sources for contaminants in that one. And I don't have slides for that, otherwise I'd have it up. There's definitely lead deposition in the soil. Say that again? Lead deposition in the soil from combustion. Yes. Right, right, right. So pre-1978, right? Um, I don't remember this. I was like two. Um, there was lead in gas. There was lead in uh, pretty much many of the exterior paints and some of the interior paints. And there was also lead in piping, right? Um, so sometimes that was piping that, that also trend, that conducted our water as well. Right? Um, in the late 70s, a tremendous amount of research uh, came to fruition in that the federal government realized that they were creating a situation where contaminants were going to be fairly ambient in the soil because of especially lead. Um, there are actually lots of heavy metals um, beyond lead, but lead is the most heavily studied one. Um, what are some other heavy metals? Copper. Mercury. Mercury. How about what's in batteries? Zinc. Zinc. Another one. Computers. Cell phones. Starts with a C. Cadmium. Cadmium. Exactly, right? Anybody ever been digging in their garden and found a battery somebody tossed? Right? Right? It happens, right? I, I worked in public housing in New York City for 17 years. We'd find batteries all the time. Um, so this part of the workshop is called Soil Sampling Risk Mapping and Exposure Prevention. It's about understanding soil quality to assess site risk and manage soils to grow food, family, and farm safely. Um, and the objective is uh, providing soil testing and best practice guidance to increase informed decision making that decreases the risk of soil contam contaminant exposure. Um, this entire presentation is based on this one piece of paper. Um, and on the back of this piece of paper is what my mother used to call a glorified photocopy. That's a really bad photocopy that still has some functionality, right? So I want you to take one and pass them. If you didn't grab these, it's basically the same thing, but on the back of this I have the, uh, yeah, that one. I have the, um, the Oakland lead uh, project article. Uh, as well, which we'll talk about, okay? Um, the other thing I'm gonna be referring to in this, and if you, if anybody needs a bigger copy because of vision, let me know. Um, the copier went nuts on me and I wound up printing a whole bunch of really tiny font versions of this article. However, this article is soup to nuts. It's called Soils in Ur Ur Urban Ag, Testing Remediation and Best Management Practices. It's one of the best articles I've ever seen uh, produced by University of California Cooperative Extension. I'm going to pass them if you didn't grab them 
And if you need a bigger one, I actually do have bigger font copies of these as well. So you let me know. I'll give you one more. If, if you need a bigger one, let me know. Um, okay, so let's fly here. Why should we care about the soil, right? Uh, soil quality is very important for the crops we grow, but it's important that we don't guess, but? Test. Test, very good, one more time. Don't guess. Test. All right, so some soils are easy to improve. Uh, plants grow best with the proper cultural care, so having an understanding of the nutrients, the soil structure um, and composition, and the soil pH as well as soil drainage uh, and water infiltration is key. Some soils are harder to improve if they have contaminants. Uh, soil quality can very much affect plant and human health, uh, which can create risk in urban situations where there have been some level of contaminant exposure. Even in the process of testing, especially in urban situations, one should take precautions. There are home tests versus lab tests. Which do you think are more precise? Lab, lab tests, very good. Um, the do-it-yourself home tests, like uh, much like the pH test, will give you some basic info, but the lab test will give you a greater amount of reliability and precision. You'll need to know if you need more liability and precision based on the land uses historically and the land uses around the site. So where are soil contaminants a, a concern? Um, historic agricultural lands that have a history of some level of pesticide spraying, especially if they were sprayed uh, with pesticides that had heavy metals in them. A lot of the older pesticides that were outlawed um, had arsenic and lead and cadmium in them, mercury. Um, residential properties, uh, contaminants are uh, only allowable for less than particular thresholds, right? Um, and then urban ag and community garden sites, very much based on the site history, and there is potentially several possible risk sources there, okay? Um, there, these, this is a list of common sources of the most common contaminants, right? Um, we talked about lead paint, we talked about lead in gasoline um, before 1978, but high traffic areas, areas that are near highways or roadways also tend to have uh, zinc. They tend to have PAHs. Can everybody say polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons? Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Right, sounds like Mary Poppins, right? Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, treated lumber had, had a tendency to have copper, chromium, arsenic in it, right? Um, it's not uncommon to hear folks say, I've got a front yard landscape where I grow flowers and shrubs. I got free access to free railroad ties. The railroad company's giving them away for free. Things to think about, right? Not saying don't use them, but know what's in them. Be you know, aware of your ambient environment. Um, burning waste, manures sometimes had a history of having um, uh, copper or zinc in them because sometimes those lands were originally sp sprayed with pesticides. So think about that, right? And then uh, coal ash, sewage sludge, petroleum spills. Once you start to see an ENE in organic chemistry, yeah. That is an indicator that you've got a double carbon bond between the two C's, right? And you start to get some really fun names after these first three because they get way more complicated in nomenclature of their names. But benzene, toluene, and xylene are the simplest of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, also, uh, you have other petro petroleum products and solvents and lead, um, other heavy metals like mercury, all depending on the site history, right? Um, and then I already mentioned the pesticides. Thing to think about also in the organic chemistry and contaminant conversations is if there's a lot of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, after a certain point, they have this other um, measure called TPHs or total petrohydrocarbons, right? So after a certain point, it's no longer economically worth the time to figure out what kind of chemical pollutant is, it is once you know it's already a petrochemical. So total petrohydrocarbons is a different measure uh, in the polycyclic aromatic, aromatic hydrocarbons conversation. 
So why are soil contaminants a concern in urban areas? Um, they can inhibit plant growth, affect our health, persist in the soil long term, and often without us knowing because they're invisible, right? And we're going to take uh, lead as one of the key examples because it's the most common, right? Uh, so lead paint hazards have led to lead dust around older homes because uh, the lead paint chips off, right, if the, if the paint hasn't been properly managed over time. Um, it also has a tendency to be around the perimeters of windows in particular. Um, and the dust comes from some of the friction of opening and closing that win those windows sometimes. Um, bare soils in yards with uh, lead contamination from house paint or previous use of leaded gasoline can be an issue. Anybody here have kids or grandkids, right? You like to let them run around in the backyard? How old's your house? These kinds of conversations become important. Anybody here have a dog? Okay, all right. For those of you who have friends with dogs, where do the dogs sleep? In the house. In the house. Do they sometimes sleep with their owners or the kids' owners? You know, the owner's kids, right? Things to think about. It's not to say that it's always a risk, but the idea is to get to know your ambient environment, learn what's out there, right? Um, it's easy to take home lead dust from construction work or certain other occupations um, as well. Um, so thinking about doing as basic as having a, a boot brush you know, outside of the backyard door uh, is a good idea. Uh, hands contaminated with uh, leaded soil, um, and then you eat with them, or you smoke cigarettes with them, right? Or you drink. Uh, they can be a way. That can be a pathway for introduction of, of uh, heavy metals into your system. Um, and then, if they were contaminated with lead paint dust. Right? If you're doing a cleanup job of an old house or a rehab, this can be a concern. Um, always le eating lead containing soil or paint dust uh, on unwashed produce can be uh, a way to introduce uh, lead and that can also affect your overall health. So how lead toxicity affects health is just one example of the whole family of heavy metals, right? Um, it can affect brain development, kidney health, reproductive health, behavioral management. Um, it can also interfere with calcium uptake, so it can, it can affect your bones and your dental situation as well. Um, and those most at risk are kids and seniors. Um, and in terms of the whole heavy metals conversation, what are the human exposure pathways, right? So soil, dust, uh, soil or dust ingestion, um, skin or eye contact, um, and that especially true for the bare feet or the pet conversation when they come into the home, uh, and then inhalation if it becomes airborne in the process of working the soil. Um, again, who's impacted? Humans, mostly kids and seniors, but pets also, and it's all very much based on the contaminant concentrations. So before we actually get started on that part, what we should think about is this. In California, the lead threshold level is 80 parts per million. In New York State, where I'm from, it's 400 parts per million. The Federal Environmental Protection Agency says the threshold level should be 400 parts per million. All of the heavy metals have varying threshold levels, whether by the state or by the federal government. They don't always align. So um, things to think about are practices that one should do if you have some level of contaminants but are still at or be below threshold levels. Beyond certain points where, where you're, you've surpassed threshold levels, you start to talk at a certain point about these things called brownfields, right? Brownfields are generally fields that are considered or perceived to be contaminated with some kind of a chemical contaminant, whether it's a heavy metal or a petrochemical, all depends, right? Um, so where to start is really doing your homework about the site. What was the site before it, right? Was it a junkyard? Was it a gas station? Was it a dry cleaner? Uh, what was that urban use, right? Uh, was it uh, some kind of industrial manufacturing facility, a smelting plant perhaps? 
perhaps, right? Um, getting your soil tested and then thinking about what you need to do if you need to improve it, if you find that you do have some level of contaminants, right? Are you at such low levels that you can remediate or you have, uh, you can do best management practices and stick to those and you should be fine, right? Um, it's very much about observing your plant's health as well. Um, also digging in the soil, finding any debris, um, doing a basic bean test, doing all of these soil structure tests we did in part one, right? So the soil history, the site history is a key way to get an indicator, right? Um, where there are contaminants used on the site? Was it an auto repair shop, right? Um, History of industrial use is one of those key ones. Auto and, and, and manufacturing, usually there's something residual left over, right? Um, and then we already talked about pre-1978 buildings with chipping paint. Um, what to look for. So one of the key things you can do that's relatively easy once you get there is go to the library and look up your Sanborn maps, right? What's the history of the site say? Another thing you can do is get to know your neighbors, which if you're gonna do any farming or gardening or, or small poultry management, anything like that, you wanna know anyway, right? You wanna make good relationships with your neighbors. But often the old timers, the folks have been around for 30 to 50 years in that neighborhood, they know what that was 25 years ago. They know what what it was 35 years ago, right? They'll tell you, um, and it's a good way to start up a conversation too. Um, so be particularly concerned about parking lots, auto repair, junkyards, machine shops, dry cleaners, gas stations, concrete plants, illegal dumping sites. Concrete is a source of calcium, so on some level one could think of it as almost a good thing, but, um, but has anybody ever been at a concrete plant? The concrete dust in the air is quite interesting, certainly to think about. Um, it's again about balance, right? Anything in excess, when there's too much of any one thing, that's when it gets to be problematic. So every side is different. Soils vary too. One of the things about urban settings, right, is that one square foot, just literally look at the, the what looks like tiles in the rug, those squares, right? One square foot to the next could have different soil quality. Right, depending. Um, so ask yourselves, are there plants gr currently growing on the site? Is it easy to dig, dig into? Are you finding any small organisms, worms, insects, insect larvae? Do you come across any debris or trash when you dig in the soil? Um, Think about doing a bean test. Plant a bean in, in uh, soil that you would buy from a local nursery shop or, or Home Depot, and then plant um, in the soil. See what the rates of growth are, compare them, right? Um, think about the exposure pathways in terms of plant and crop contaminants, right? Um, through plant roots, so plant root uptake, one definitely has to do lab tests to find out if the plants have some level of contaminants of heavy metals in them. Um, and at that point, those contaminants are internal. So the question becomes, now what? Um, what are you going to do? What are your practices, right? Um, what are your threshold levels? If they are topical, so the, the dust right, falls on plant leaves or you're near a historical highway, right? Um, you can uh, still have some level of contaminants from the dust. You should get some lab tests. Often these contaminants are not visible to the naked eye. Some of this can be managed through good washing, right? Um, so plant uh, external on, on the top, the, the topical foliar layer or the, the surface layer of the stems or, or roots or leaves, right? Um, if contamination is found, ask yourself, how are you gonna manage your soils using best management practices based on the case, based on where you are with your threshold levels? Contaminants are a bigger concern when you're talking about greens and you're talking about root crops. Okay, um, they are less of a concern, uh, especially in terms of plant root uptake when you're talking about woody trees and shrubs because of that extra set of membrane layers that those contaminants have to pass through. However, you can still get your fruits, you can still get topical exposure with dust on your fruits um, through the air, especially again if you're near a highway or a, or a site that had uh, lead on the exterior of the building. 
So how do you know, right? You get your soil tested. But a lot of folks don't always think it through and they go, they run, they, they're, they're kind of, they get spring fever and they want to get their soil tested, right? Um, and they don't always map where they took the soil samples, right? So then they get their test results back and they're like, wait a minute, I didn't write down, I didn't draw a map of where I took all my sample spots, right? So. Um, when you're mapping your food growing site, areas that show differences in plant growth uh, should be sampled separately. Um, areas where there's evidence of peeling paint, older homes, um, you want to take five to six samples per area at a depth of four to six inches of soil. Um, remove decomposing foliage, uh, you want to sift it if possible. Keep accurate notes by site area um, and each distinct area should be sampled. So in terms of mapping, and, you, and just taking as one example this landscape design on the lower right, right? Um, make map notes with different sample site locations, whether it's front, back, side yard. Um, map your garden based on planting areas. So maybe one area has your native plants, maybe one area has your veggies, another area has your fruit trees, maybe another area has your landscape plants. All depends on how you grow food or flowers, but um, map them and get a sense of the differentiation. And then um, further moving on that, right, urban ag sites um, are often sites that were abandoned or someone was sitting on the, on the property and speculating on it to wait till the land values grew. Um, sometimes they were abandoned because they were contaminated and someone could not afford to do the cleanup. Um, I want to highlight a couple of great urban farms. I don't know, I'm still learning my San Francisco farms and community gardens. Alamany Farm is one of the big ones here in San Francisco, worth visiting. They do a lot of great workshops. Um, in the East Bay, we have uh, City Slicker Farms West Oakland Farm Park that's worth visiting, especially on like a Saturday. Um, or Urban Tills North Richmond Farm, I think it's called Roots and Restoration Farm now, are, are also worth checking out. Um, so here's an example of a backyard grid, right? Let's say it was a, an even, I don't know, um, 80 feet by 100 feet width, right? Um, you had a gas station or a dry cleaner on the left. The house was pre-1978. So you're taking more samples near the house. You're taking more samples near the contaminant sort based on the site history. And then you're taking samples where you're going to grow your veggies and your veggie beds as well, right? Um, UC Cooperative Extension, just about every county in the state, uh, the Master Gardener program lists the map of, uh, I'm sorry, the list of all the soil lab tests in the county. Right? So you can go to the UC Cooperative Extension website by county except for San Francisco because we don't have an office here um, and uh, identify potential labs to check out. Most labs will uh, test for and the EPA suggests at the very minimum testing for pH, organic matter, nutrients. Most, tests, uh, most labs will test for lead. Not all te uh, labs will test for the other contaminants like pHs, uh, TPHs or heavy metals. Uh, but you're going to have a clue on whether you really need those tests based on the homework you did about the site history. Um, so it's very much just like with getting to know your plant, it's about getting to know your site, right? So you know your plant culture, you know your site history, you get to know your soil quality, you can really start to grow things. Uh, how should samples be collected? Sampling strategy is going to be very much based on the site conditions. Um, Sampling the soil surface alone, you, if you're worried about the soil surface, uh, you're thinking because you're next to a highway maybe and there was gaseous deposition, um, then sampling the top couple of inches makes sense. If you're sampling food growing site for annual vegetables, 6 to 12 or 6 to 18 inches is more your plan, right? Um, for both, it's about making a composite sample, so taking from several spots, just to go back to the map, right? So if you're taking a composite sample, you're taking your, let's say the six where the X's are in this grid, you combine them all together, you're going to do some thorough mixing and from that 
you pull your composite sample from the six subsamples that you've mixed in a bucket, right? You're wearing gloves because you don't know if there's lead in the soil, right? You might want to think about a mask or goggles. Um, and you're sending that in. You get your test results back. This comes up red. There's some mercury in there or some arsenic or something, right? That's when you go back and you, maybe you test each X and you send those into the lab, get more results, get a sense of where your boundaries are in terms of the contaminant levels, okay? Um, so just fast forwarding. Sample preparation, we're almost done. Map the sample spots, collect and mix the composite sample. You dry it if, you, if the lab won't dry it for you. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. You, it's a good idea to sift it to get any small rocks and, and leaf debris out. Remove and bag the sample and then send or deliver it to the lab. Um, Use clean equipment, um, and then you're going to test your subsample areas if you find the, the uh, contaminant results. Again, veggies 1 to 18 inches, turf 1 to 6, shrubs, roses 1 to 12 inches, small trees 6 to 8 inches, deep rooted trees and shrubs 6 to 24, 36 inches. Okay. Um, and I pretty much went through, the, uh, went through that. One other thing to keep in mind, um, and we learned a little bit more about this in part one than part two, but um, if you work wet soil, the process of turning that soil strips the nutrients off of it much in the same way um, that erosion strips the, that organic matter off of the top layer of the soil. Same concept. So if you're going to work the soil, work it when it's dry, but if it gets really dusty, you may have to wear a mask. Things to think about. I'm not trying to create a scare. It's important to just be aware of what's in your ambient environments, right? Um, so best practices, and then we're all done. Um, test soils, don't guess. Don't guess. Test. Test. Thank you. Um, if uh, you want to confirm that lead is particularly less than 80 parts per million, you want to buy Omri, right? So we had the example I think you brought up during the break about landscape, a, la a composting company um, that has uh, around their yard, they uh, let their employees grow food in the compost that they've created, right? Um, so know what goes into your compost. If it had uh, landscape pesticide use, you have the potential for some level of residual pesticides in your compost and it all depends on the kind of chemical and how their process was and whether it heated up enough and all of that. Wearing gloves and practicing good hygiene, boots and boot brushes are a good idea before going into the house. Don't let kids garden or play in greater than 80 parts per million of soils in California or 400 parts per million in New York. Right? Uh, raise beds using compost, importing clean soil, making, um, oops, making your own compost is a good idea, amending with compost and organic matter, mulching to reduce upsplash. So visualize this, a soil that doesn't have a mulch, here's my mulches sample, uh, a soil that doesn't have a mulch, right? Um, the rain hits or you're hand watering, right? Hopefully in California we've gone fully beyond hand watering, but let's say you're hand watering, right? The rain hits that up splatter from the soil onto the undersides of the leaves. If you're eating leafy greens, right? That has the potential to be a, a contaminant exposure source. So things to think about, but if you mulch, right? You can reduce that up splash very much so. Um, and also reduce dust as well. You can also, um, with mulch, reduce your weeds, retain moisture, all those other good benefits as well, right? Um, when I'm talking about mulch in veggie beds, am I talking about wood chips? No. no. I'm talking about straw on the west coast or straw or hay on the east coast, right? Um, the kinds of materials that'll break down somewhat quicker. The thing about wood chips is 
for the first three to five years as it's breaking down, it'll tie up a little bit of nitrogen in your soil. So if you're going to use wood chips, it's not impossible to use it. You have an excess of wood chips, right, in the environment. We can get wood chips from tree care companies all the time, uh, for free a lot of the time. They're very happy to come and dump. Um, but you may have to amend with compost underneath that if that's going to be your mulch. Right? Um, and then subsurface irrigate, again, to prevent upsplash. So drip irrigation uh, or inline irrigation is the way very much to go, right? Preventing upsplash onto the plant parts. Um, adjusting growth, nutrition, and pH, right? A soil near neutral, six to seven, is less likely to have contaminant issues because the contaminants are going to be more on the outer perimeter of the pH scale. Uh, Promoting good infiltration and, and drainage. If you've got a site that has a slope, where does the water accumulate? The bottom of the slope. What else do you think accumulates there? Potential contaminants, right? The things to think about. Um, and then uh, if you've got a site where you're at or below threshold levels, right? Soaking your produce in uh, a little bit of uh, solution with some vinegar in it um, will actually serve as a surfactant. It'll get some of the dust off. And that becomes especially important in leafy greens like what? Lettuce. Lettuce, kale, cabbage. What else? Chard, collard greens, right? Those deep, deeply veinated leaves, right? Where the dust accumulates in particular, right? More of a concern, again, more urban situations a lot of the time. Um, and then lastly, avoid waste derived fertilizers, right? Particularly uh, um, observe the process, read the labels, make sure you, you have no. Um, er Carnivore manure in the in the uh, your soil beds. Wear gloves. Practice good hygiene. Um, and I think I repeated that one. Okay. Grow and raise beds. And then something else. The article uh, which had uh, this on the front of it. The uh, the EPA's. Uh, Lead in Oakland Soils article, they did some great experimental work uh, using fishbone meal, which has a lot of phosphorus in it, and it tied up a lot of the lead in the soils. So worth reading that article uh, and checking that out. Well, using well-rotted manure, regularly amending with compost, maintaining soil pH, adding limestone where too acidic, and that's pretty much it. Um, last things, take a look at your jars. Do you have your layers? I don't know. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I want to also mention a couple things. Um, these two voluminous books are out of UC Santa Cruz, their Agroecology Apprenticeship Program. I have digital versions of these, so if you're interested, I'm happy to email them to you. I will probably email them to Miguel and ask him if he can email to the list. Um, the other thing is most, you know, the U.S. Geological Soil, uh, Soil Survey did this and or the local county ag department did these. So sometimes you'll find antiques like the old Soil, soil Survey. These are really great um, if you've got a less than urbanized situation. Um, and with that, I just need you to please complete evals. I should have asked you for this earlier, but I forgot. Um, so one, two, three, four. There you go, pass those that way. And they look like they're the same, but they're not. And pass those the other way. And that's it, guys. I'm pretty much done. You got any questions? Oh, yeah. So, you know, in the soils conversation these days, a lot of folks are talking about carbon and carbon sequestration and how soils can be used to sequester carbon. Um, what they don't always think about is carbon crops, right? So, anybody ever heard of a guy named John Jevons? Right? Ecology in action. Um, he, inv he wrote the book. It's something like how to grow more. Yeah, grow biointensive is the method he, he established. But he wrote the book. It's called something like How to Grow More Vegetables, Fruits, and Nuts, and Berries Than You Ever Thought Possible in, in Less Space Than You Ever Imagined, or something like that. It's a really long um, title. But one of the things he came up with was that you could significantly increase your fertility by adding um, 
what, what he called compost crops, or which were basically like high carbon source crops into your compost itself. So let's say you've got a zucchini that's gone rotten on you, toss it in your compost pile, you're adding, there's a lot of carbohydrates in that zucchini. Potato, same concept, right? Adding a lot of carbon into your compost pile. Um, although not so much the woody kind of carbon, more of carbohydrates, right? But it's a way to add a lot of carbon to your compost, which then you add to your soil, and then you're sequestering more carbon over time. Um, so that's why I have the potato. But good question, I'm glad you asked. Um, the chocolate I just forgot to eat. Does anybody want some? <laughs> it's 85% cacao. That's right. <laughs> Thank you so much. For Thank you. And that's my phone number or an email if you ever want to email me. And my cards are over there.